everybody. Um, if I can just introduce myself. I'm Rachel Stopard. I'm the Chief Executive of the Greater Cambridge Partnership. Um, I'm actually just a warm-up act for Dan Clark, who's going to do the uh, bulk of the presentation today. Um, but I just wanted to, uh, by way of context, just introduce the Greater Cambridge Partnership. So for those of you that don't know uh, who we are or what we are, um, we are the uh, partnership, which is local authorities, the business community, and also the university, uh, that came together to Uh, where they have invested uh, a significant amount of money in the area, um, 500 million if we uh, achieve a number of uh, steps along the way, which is to support economic growth in the Greater Cambridge area, which is effectively Cambridge City and South Town, the sort of ring of donuts around Cambridge. So it's about um, delivering this economic growth either in, in an accelerated way or delivering more than we would have done if we hadn't had that sort of investment. We work across a number of um, work streams, so uh, primarily most of our investment is going on transport, and, and most of you as business people will obviously recognise that uh, transport is now a significant uh, issue for you and your workforce in terms of being able to get people to work. The congestion issue that we have is, um, we know from feedback from businesses, is causing congestion problems. We have a target of reducing congestion. Uh, it's a 2011 target, which was to say uh, we needed to reduce congestion um, back then, but because of the growth that we've already had, we're now looking at sort of a 25% reduction in congestion that we need to try to achieve. So to put that into context, we need to try to get one in four vehicles off the road. In order to do that, we've got to provide alternatives and a better public transport network that is good for people accessing uh, businesses and moving about the area in a better way. We're doing that in combination uh, with the mayor and the combined authorities. So we're supporting uh, a network uh, that's based on a rubber-tied metro system. We have planned to deliver the first phase of that by sort of 2022 to 2023, with uh, groups coming into Cambridge. But none of this is uh, deliverable without a whole range of uh, different interventions. And actually, what we're going to hear about today in May is the work that we're doing in our smart Cambridge, uh, our smart city work stream which is about uh, ways in which we can really use some of the technology to support that. Uh, I'm happy to sort of pick up questions at the end, as is uh, Dan, uh, but I think uh, I'll hand over to Dan and he can run through a bit more detail on what we're doing. Sure. Thanks very much. So um, I'm Dan Clark. I'm the program manager of the Smart Cambridge program. So as Rich said, we're part of the Great Cambridge Partnership. And we were set up to look at how new and emerging technology can help the program to deliver some of its aims. So while the wider program is delivering transport uh, improvement, what we're looking at is how we can reduce some of the friction within the transport system and make it easier for people to use and access transport, but also to look at some of the new mobility models that are emerging. So I thought it would just be useful to give you an overview of the work that we're doing. Uh, so, uh, the Smart Cambridge team are very small and we rely on collaboration, so that's key to all the work that we're doing. So we collaborate widely with businesses, with small businesses, with large businesses like Arm and Microsoft. Um, we work very closely with the universities. We've done work with Anglia Ruskin University. In fact, we have been doing some work with the Reactor program, uh, looking at gamification. We uh, do a lot of work with the University of Cambridge with the computer labs, and we actually uh, fund two people within the computer lab to do data work for us. They built a data platform, um, and they're helping us with data analytics. Uh, we work with transport companies, and it's really that collaboration which has allowed us to do the things that we've done with such a small team. Uh, the key collaboration, though, is with local residents and um, with local communities. So we've run a number of hack events where people have come along. We've looked at specific problems within the city. Just after Christmas, we looked at wayfinding and how we could use digital technology to make wayfinding better. And that's informed some of the work that we've been doing. And on Monday and Tuesday, actually, we were running an internet of things hack where uh, people came along with some ideas about how we can both improve transport, but also how we can collect data and measure movement within the city better. Because to be able to really uh, aim and target our interventions, we need to know how the city is performing, and that's through data. So, I mean, Greater Cambridge is really successful. We know it's the fastest growing city in the UK. 
um, the most patent applications per head of the population than anywhere else in the country. Uh, but with that comes pressure. So we already know the transport system is almost at capacity. We've got a number of big businesses moving into the area. So on the biomedical campus, AstraZeneca have recently relocated there. And if their staff can't get in and out of these employment sites easily, then the staff will move elsewhere. So we really need to make it as easy as possible for people to move around the city and to access employment. And we have this kind of perfect storm of uh, a congested transport system and house prices that are pushing people further and further out of the city, so people are having to travel further. Um, we're also seeing a huge amount of growth. So as you know, there are new developments being planned for North Stow, Bourne, a uh, big new town at Water Beach, so 33,500 new houses by 2030, which will bring more jobs. But if we don't have the infrastructure to support that, then it, it won't work. We've got 50,000 employees coming in and out of the city every day. Um, every year, we've got 10.5 million people using the rail network. Um, and if we don't do anything, it's just going to get worse and worse. So that's our challenge, and uh, Rachel talked about this. So we need to basically get one in four people out of their cars and using public transport. And one of the ways that we can do that, already one in 14 people in the eastern region work from home, is to support people and allow them to easily work from home and to create businesses where they actually are and not have to travel in. So our sister program, the Connecting Cambridgeshire program, is investing in superfast broadband. Um, we already have uh, it's uh, ninety percent of homes or ninety six percent of homes and businesses we've reached with two fast broadband. We're looking to make that ninety seven percent by twenty nineteen, and then we're aiming to get over ninety nine percent by twenty twenty. We're also looking at how we can improve mobile coverage, so we're working with mobile operators. Uh, the county council has a huge stake, it has farms, it has infrastructure. So actually, how can mobile operators use the infrastructure that we've got to push out mobile coverage into rural areas? And then we're looking at the next generation. So 5G is coming through, which will allow uh, homes and businesses to have super fast speeds through mobile connectivity. And we've got some funding to run a 5G trial. But one of the key emerging things that we're seeing is that actually technology is tra changing the way that transport is delivered. And these are the kind of emerging trends that we're seeing. So um, there's a lot of companies that are investing in and trialing autonomous vehicles at the moment. So we know of three companies in Cambridge who are looking to trial autonomous cars in the city over the next two years. We're really interested in autonomy, autonomy, but not actually autonomous cars. What we're interested in is autonomous shuttles as part of the public transport system. As a city, we need to watch the trend with autonomous cars. We need to think about how we're going to react to them once they do come into the city. But in the short term, actually, autonomous shuttles, we think, have a key role uh, within the public transport system in providing first and last mile transport. And I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, cars are becoming more connected, so it's easy to give people messages. It's easy to understand who's traveling where and when. And we're also seeing shared vehicles coming into the market. So we've had a number of conversations with people like Chariot, who are run by Ford, and that's on demand and shared. So you would book a place on, the, on a minibus, it would then come and pick you up, it would pick other people up on its way to taking you to wherever you want to go. Uh, on demand, so uh, these are on demand shuttles that are operating in Milton Keynes at the moment. They will eventually be driverless. Uh, they've got a swarm of them in the city centre. They go from the uh, railway station and they deliver people into various parts of the city. And then transport is also becoming more integrated. People are taking much more multimodal journeys. So they're using bikes, they're using car, train and bus. And it's about how you bring all that information together and ticketing and payments together to make it as easy as possible for people to use transport and to access. And then we're also seeing the electrification of transport. So there's work going on looking at the electrification of bus fleets in Cambridge. Uh, we're looking at electrification of taxi fleets. And how can we encourage more and more people to take up electric cars? Because air quality is one of the key issues that we have as a city. So obviously we need to make the air cleaner. So some of the short-term work that we've been doing is looking at how we can use data and information better to inform people's journeys. So 
with the University of Cambridge, we built a real-time data platform. We're looking at how we can make that information as accurate and as useful as possible. So we've built a multimodal, multi-operator travel app that includes all the buses from Wicket, all the buses from Stagecoach, train information, walking and cycling information, all on one app, which wasn't available at the time that we started to develop the product. And you can access that in the Apple Store and the Android Store. And the idea is, is just gives you better real-time information and gives people much more certainty about their journeys. So actually on the uh, display on the map, you can actually watch your bus coming towards you where uh, live bus information is available. Then we've uh, put up a, a totem to one of these, uh, the railway station, which gives uh, real-time bus information. Uh, on the back, it gives real-time train information. We did a lot of work with some focus groups to make the user experience um, as best as possible. So what we've done is we've split down buses into the central town, buses into Addenbrookes, and then more generally, uh, some of the buses out to the village. What we saw before was that uh, with a lot of the information that was displayed, buses were going through the centre of town, but it was displayed as going to a village like Kiston. But people that were visiting the city for the first time didn't know that it was going through the centre. So we really thought carefully about how we display information. And then on the bottom of the touch screen, which gives you visitor information, uh, if there's events on in the city. So we've worked with Visit Cambridge and the bid on what can be displayed on that. And then we've also built uh, a lobby screen, which can sit in the entrance to buildings. And these are available to all businesses. All you need is a TV and a small Raspberry Pi to run it. Um, and it gives real-time bus information. So it's all contextual to the building. Real-time uh, train information. Uh, we can, or if you have one of these, you can go into the back end, you can choose what bus stops you want to display. We've got real-time traffic information and you can put messages on it. And the idea is that if you're sat in a building uh, and you want to plan your onward journey, you know exactly when the bus is going to arrive, you know if your trains are late. And it's just all about giving people better real-time information. And the other area that we're really interested in is ticketing. So at the moment, you may buy a Whippet ticket, a stagecoach ticket, a train ticket. Is there a way that we can begin to integrate ticketing and payments? It's really difficult in a market, a public transport market at the moment, because it's deregulated. Buses are run by private companies. Uh, then we have the train operators. And trying to bring all those parties together is very difficult. But it's something that we're working on. And again, it's all about making it as easy as possible to access buses, trains, and the public transport system. And the future of this is something called mobility as a service. So on average, your car sits outside your house about 90% of the time. Um, this is all about on demand. It's a bit like Netflix. So instead of going out and buying a video or buying a, a record, you can uh, rent individual bits of mobility. So what you would do is you would plan your journey and the app would tell you, well, actually, there's an off-road bike at the end of the road. If you cycle to the bus stop, there's a bus that leaves in 15 minutes, um, and then your train leaves uh, in an hour. Uh, all the payments happen on the platform, so it's uh, they're moving towards a one-click payment uh, methodology. And then the idea is eventually what you would do is you would uh, have a package. So you would subscribe to a monthly transport package that would include all your mobility needs. And what they're trying to do is make accessing public transport easier than actually owning a car. So this is a, something that's beginning to emerge. There's a pilot in the West Midlands. We're hoping to do something in Cambridge uh, at the end of this year, the beginning of next year. Uh, it's going to take time, but it could radically transform the way that people access transport. And autonomous vehicles. So we're beginning to see autonomous shuttles more and more being deployed in trials around the world. Uh, there's a number of on-campus deployments in Europe, so Berlin and Switzerland. We've actually tried a uh, autonomous four-seater shuttle on the guided busway. And one of the things that Cambridge has is a segregated corridor, which makes it easier for us to trial these vehicles. And the use case that we're looking at is first and last mile. So we've been working with the Wellcome Trust. Uh, Whittles, uh, Whittlesford uh, railway station sits about a mile and a half, two miles away from the, uh, the Wellcome campus. But at the moment, only about 2% of their staff are using the rail network to get to work. And that's because it's very difficult to get from the station into the campus. And what they want to do is build a segregated corridor and have on-demand 
10 to 12 seat vehicles that can pick people up and take them into the campus on demand. And that would be able to run 24 hours a day. And on research campuses, that could be quite important because they have researchers who are coming in and out at all times. So we did a feasibility study with them. We looked at using the guided busway, and we now have 3.2 million from government and an industrial partner. And we'll be building six 12, 14 seat vehicles that will be running out of hours. So they won't be running within the bus fleets, but the bus services at the moment stop at nine o'clock and they uh, continue at six o'clock in the morning. So there's this big gap. And obviously the biomedical campus is 24 hours a day. We've got shift workers coming in and out from Adambrooks. We've got a new hospital. Uh, research facilities again. So these vehicles will be piloted running from the railway station out to the biomedical campus and then to the park and ride. And the idea is to begin to join up all these different transport nodes using uh, autonomous vehicles. Initially they'll have a driver, but the aim is towards the end of the project, which is a two and a half year project, to be able to take the driver out of that. And they will be on demand. So you'll have an app and you'll be able to call them up. Um, we're also looking at the next step. So uh, we've just put in another funding bid into government and we'll be looking to bring those vehicles off the busway and onto the campus so they'll be able to drive around and pick people up. And we're also hoping to work with an autonomous vehicle uh, company to look at whether we can go uh, pick people up from the villages on demand using autonomous vehicles with drivers initially and feed them into the park and ride to create a kind of a whole system. So it will take you from your house into uh, the biomedical campus. And initially, they will have a driver and they'll be on demand. So you'll be able to call them up. They'll work their way around the villages, pick people up, take them to the park and ride. But the idea is to eventually take the driver out. By taking the driver out, that greatly reduces the cost of delivering transport. So it makes it much more feasible to have a wider network. And then eventually, this fits into the mayor's vision for CAM. So CAM will be an autonomous mass rapid transit system using rubber wheel buses, which will transport, transport uh, high volumes of people, particularly at peak hours. But again, you've still got that first and last mile issue. How do people get to the transport hubs where, uh, that this will serve? And that again is where on demand and uh, autonomous vehicles will come in because it will be able to take people into those transport hubs to transfer onto mass rapid transit. So you can see you're starting to develop uh, a much wider transport system that covers a much wider area and begins to solve some of the issues around uh, people traveling in from rural areas. Uh, I think the most important thing is at the moment uh, it's once you're in your car, it's very tempting to continue your journey in your car. If we can take people out of their car because the public transport is so good, why would you take your car? Then that's really going to create the kind of shift that we're looking for. And then the other thing that we're seeing is a huge growth in uh, white vans coming into Cambridge and delivering uh, packages. So we've got a number of pieces of work. One is actually looking at drones. So Cambridge was the first place that had an Amazon drone delivery. So is there a future for drones uh, in logistics and city logistics? We are uh, also looking at uh, bulking up on the edge of town and seeing whether we can disaggregate into smaller electric vehicles. And um, actually, what impact do things like uh, supermarket deliveries have on the amount of vehicles that travel around the city? So the university have a project looking at logistics at the moment and uh, to see how many cars a supermarket delivery will take off the road. And if they're taking a lot of vehicles off the road, then should we be encouraging that sort of behavior? So they, you know, transport is changing really quickly and technology companies are driving that. I mean, we've seen companies like Oppo, and they're only five years old, and they've already spread across the world and become pretty ubiquitous in most cities, or most major cities you go to, places like Mobile. And they're really changing the way that people are accessing transport. So actually, keeping up with this as a, you know, as a local authority can be very difficult. That's why we work with a lot of other partners. But we need to harness this, because this could radically transform the way that we're moving. Um, and we're seeing a whole load of other new technologies that are coming into the market. So actually the person we're working with on the autonomous vehicles is working on Hyperloop, which I don't know if you know is a tube uh, transport system that travels incredibly quickly. 
Uh, there are people looking at that at the moment, not quite in this area. Uh, we're also, uh, the scooter uh, companies coming into the market in the States with the scooters. Um, this is uh, Uber Air, and I've seen their delivery plan for this. They're hoping to have this up and running by 2026. We've got 5AI, who are a Cambridge company, who are developing autonomous taxi services. So I think the message is that we need to use technology to deliver real change in the short term. But we need to keep an eye on these long-term trends and harness, where possible, some of the improvements that are coming through. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? So uh, the Welcome Trust own most of the land between the campus and the station. I mean, it would be a really low impact, pretty much just the tarmac road. So they are looking at the moment. Uh, I think they are going to begin to engage with local communities. Um, and the, they are planning a big new campus on the other side of the road from the current site as well. So it's all tied in with uh, the work that they're doing around that. Is uh, car counting technology being considered to know how many cars are on the road at uh, on time, mentioned real time data? And yeah, so uh, we've worked with mobile phone companies to understand what data they can provide. Uh, there is actually a Bluetooth network on the road uh, it roads in Cambridge, and so cars with Bluetooth devices, or if you've got your mobile phone on a Bluetooth device, it pings the uh, device. That's then hacked, so we don't know who you are. Uh, it pings it again as you go past the other device, and then that will tell us how much traffic flows and the number of cars travelling. Um, the traffic lights also have uh, loops in the road, which just how fast they go over them. So there is data on the number of cars that are traveling around the road network, but we know there are gaps. So what we're looking at is where there are gaps, how we can collect that data. Uh, the big uh, shortfalls in data we do have that we're looking at is things like pedestrian flows and some uh, cycling data around the city. So we're looking at how we can collect that at the moment. We've got a number of trials that are going on with companies that use cameras, uh, and they can count uh, pedestrians, cars, vans. Um, it's, it's all anonymized. Um, and then uh, we're using uh, artificial intelligence to uh, do things like predict car park queues. So we've got a pilot going on to see whether we can see how long it takes for a traffic queue uh, for a car to get into a car parking space. And then if we add on the journey time from the edge of the city to the back of the uh, car parking queue and how long it takes to get into the space, we can, on the BMS signs, when you come into Cambridge, the signs that kind of give you different messages. We could say actually it takes an hour to get from here into your underground arcade car park space for 15 minutes by the bus. And then hopefully that will begin to notice behaviours because people will see the acts at the time it takes them to travel. Is it a different generation? Because when Brexit or Alana take away now, yeah. I wonder why I stopped using the park and rock because she couldn't understand the situation. So I think, you know, you, I know a user experience is really important. And so, you know, uh, engaging with a very a wide range of people to get uh, to understand how we can make uh, using things like ticket machines or the information that we've got as easy as possible is really important. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I agree. You know, if, if it's really difficult for people to use ticket machines, then uh, to use the public transport system, then that's what people offer. So what we're trying to do is make it as easy as possible for everybody. When you look at the range, of, like, how far out are you looking at the ocean and some voices in the back? But is that just the main corridor or the villages off, off the ocean? So, I mean, at the moment, our funding is from the Greater Cambridge Partnership. So we look at the, it's Cambridge and the kind of the donuts around, so say, South Cambridge here. Um, but, you know, we need to recognise that people travel from all over the place to come into Cambridge. So actually, we need to reach people outside. So, yes, I mean, quite a wide area. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, giving people information from because you know people don't start and end their journeys just in Cambridge or surrounding area. But it's key because I'm a bit of the go to say I've got me for Google Maps. If I've got a Cambridge location, it might say 20 minutes by car, it might say an hour and 20 minutes by public transport. That's right. I've got a one hour meeting. I haven't got more to spend for one hour meeting. That's right. And they said the work that the GCP are doing is to make it, you know, make public transport more reliable um, and quicker. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll see that uh, coming on screen over the next couple of years. Uh, but you're right, you know, we, we need to make public transport better private car other people, otherwise it's going to be difficult to get people out this time. Yeah. So, 
I feel like we're getting back to the shuttle bus, I suppose, to actually take the park and Why can't the park and ride all just go all in one place? If we could actually do that with the park and ride, we can actually cascade people from broader areas. Yeah. That would be a massive opportunity. Yeah, and you know, as the technology matures, and also there's a legislative framework that we're operating in at the moment, which means that you can't actually do as much as you may want to. But as we see the technology emerging and government are really looking at the uh, legislative framework, hopefully we'll be able to do more and more. I mean, it's going to take time, it's not going to be immediate. But I think your autonomous vehicles uh, offer a huge opportunity, particularly for rural transport, because one of the things that, uh, that has Kind of prevented rural transport is the cost of operating it when you've got a driver um, and you know the cost of vehicles, the cost of operating. Actually, electric vehicles uh, in the long term are cheaper to operate, and then you take the driver out. And hopefully, we can get to a point where it's economically viable to uh, run in a rural area. You seem to just take the It's insensible, really, but it's practical to mention it point of view or. And issues you might have, but you have fast trams to the park and ride to keep to the centre. That's what you need. Because one of the problems is, autonomous vehicles are going to be slow. If you get in a park and ride, it takes quite a long time for the bus to get into town. And people want to just ram them into the park and ride, not have to fill in the machines. You know, if you subscribe to the centre, it's going to be some sort of system where you don't have to fill your bag of hay. You go straight into town in you know, five minutes on the fastest tram. What you really need, obviously, it may not be practical, but cheaper. Are you looking at that? Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely what the vision is. And so the uh, the county network at, at the moment is predicated on um, going into tunnels under the most congested part of the city. There's a lot of work to be done as to whether that's, you know, the business case stacked up, but that, that's what the mayor's ambition is, is to actually go into tunnels. If, if it doesn't go into tunnels, you definitely need to free up the road space so that your public transport can be going, you know, without being stuck in the same queues as you would be in if you're in a, in a car. So I suppose the other bit of this conversation is to say there needs to be a bit of a stick as well as the carrot. So we will need to think of ways of um, encouraging people out of their cars. And so we're looking at a range of uh, ways of doing that. So it may be some form of road charging is, is on the table to consider uh, as part of that. And we would only do that if we've managed to deliver a world-class public transport system that is a suitable alternative for everybody to use. But we need money to do that. So our sort of calculations are we need to invest another 20 million just in the running of the public transport system. Um, if, if public funds need to pay for that, we need to raise that revenue in some way because as most of you know, there isn't a lot of money around. But, but that is absolutely the vision, an integrated ticketing and you know, contactless and some sort of way of having an account where you get benefits for doing the right thing and then you pay uh, if you do want to use a car park, it all comes off your account, it's in your iPhone, or, you know, that's the sort of uh, territory that we want to get to. And I think it is within reach of this vision. In terms of, you know, terms of local economy, you know, from where I am in Bassendorf, I would be able to go to Stevens before Cambridge. I'd like to get to Stevens in 20 minutes. It's yeah. going to take me at least 40 minutes to get in the middle of Cambridge. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Well, and that reflects the general view we're hearing from business people will make choices away from this area unless we address these issues, which is absolutely what government recognised when it funded the city deal, you know, three years ago. Well, I haven't lived in Cambridge for 40 years, so I did. Now it's almost a place I don't go, so that's yeah. awesome. No, we absolutely are intent on changing. <laughs> if that's all the questions, I think we've probably used our slot and we need to let you go back to the buzzing exhibition. So thank you very much for coming and listening to you. Uh, I'm not on me. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>